Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. That is, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo with the Wall Street Journal here with Kim Strassel and Kate Batchelder Odell. And yesterday we told you about the very, very big disappointment that Republicans uh, had in Wisconsin in losing the race for the uh, swing seat on the state Supreme Court. And when we say losing, we mean losing. I mean, they got routed. And the implications of that are really quite troubling for Republicans in 2024. But interesting event in North Carolina on uh, Wednesday when a Democratic uh, member of the state uh, house, uh, Tricia Cotham, switch parties. Let's listen to her explain why. I have decided to change my party affiliation, joining the Republican Party, and have been welcomed with open arms by my colleagues. And I'm glad to call you all my colleagues. As long as I have been a Democrat, the Democrats have tried to be a big tent. But this now where we are, modern day Democratic Party, has become unrecognizable to me and to so many others throughout this state and this country. The party wants to villainize anyone who has free thought, free judgment, has solutions, who wants to get to work to better our state, not just sit in a meeting and have a workshop after a workshop but really work with individuals to get things done, because that's what real public servants do. Kim, the defection here gives the Republicans a supermajority in the state House of Representatives. They already had a supermajority in the Senate, which means that if they stay united, they could potentially override the vetoes of Democratic Governor Roy Cooper, and that could have significant consequences for legislation in the state. And so we haven't seen a lot of these defections in states of late. And it's interesting that one of the motivators here for Cotham apparently was school choice. Yes. She said that her decision is out on that to talk about the need to have more diversity in terms of educational options caused her party to shun her, to call her a traitor. She claims that liberal groups contacted her children to bully them, to try to intimidate her. She said the kind of final straws when she got lambasted for prayer and American flag emojis on her social media, and she just couldn't take it anymore. Those emojis will get you every time. Yeah, I know. Those emojis. I mean, that was the thing that was like the tipping point. I just love that. I thought it was sort of funny. Even more than her children being bullied, it was the fact that people were rapping on her social media emojis. Yeah, Kim, I just have to say, that's why my emails and my texts are emoji-free zones. (laughs) <laughs> Me too, actually, Paul. <laughs> I give people enough of a target uh, without also giving them an emoji target. But look, this is, I think this is really notable because we've seen this in the Democratic Party. There has been this kind of circling of the wagons, this purity test. And guess what? You want purity? Okay, now you got it. The people who are a little bit more free thinking, who might have a different view on issues, a fringe issue here or there, you're going to kick them out of the party? Okay. Now you got a completely pure party. You don't necessarily have the votes anymore that you need. And I think this is very notable. So Governor Cooper has, over the past four years, issued 47 vetoes of Republican legislation. It's been very frustrating to them. And I want to just add a note of caution here. I don't think that Cotham is going to become a sure thing on every issue that comes down the Republican line. This is a woman who, when she was elected, you know, she campaigned on a $15 minimum wage. She campaigned campaign on expansion of Medicaid. She campaigned on LGBTQ rights. By the way, all the more reason to ask why Democrats were so happy to kick her out of their party. But there are going to be some issues here, like school choice, where Republicans now potentially have the ability to pass some bills and with her support, and if Republicans stay together, to potentially override those Cooper vetoes. So you got to ask, what was the Democratic Party thinking? And I guess the answer is it wasn't. Yeah, then just an interesting story statement, Kate, by Cotham when she announced her move related to to school choice. And she said, uh, we have to evolve, citing the education lessons that parents learn.
learned during the pandemic. One size fits all in education is wrong for children, but the Democratic Party didn't really want to talk about children. They had talking points for adults and adult organizations, and I think we all know what organization she means. She means the teachers' union. Right. Cece, Randy Weingarten. I do think there's a huge political opportunity here. The state, for instance, you could lift the income cap on the state scholarship program and allow more students to use that to defray the cost of private schools. We've seen such a flight from the public schools after COVID lockdowns. We've seen so much parental dissatisfaction, not just with some of the culture war issues we discussed, like critical race theory, but just on the basics of the quality of math that their children are able to do, these kinds of core educational issues, that there's a huge appetite for change. And the Democratic Party has basically, to her point, stuck with the unions in lockstep, refused to entertain any kind of experimentation. And so that's left Republicans here with a wide open field to run on a great issue for them of upward mobility, of opportunity. And hopefully now the North Carolina GOP will use that opening. All right. It's fascinating. Of course, really interesting. This morning, my email had a couple of uh, missives suggesting that, well, if Trisha Cotham can do it in North Carolina. How about Joe Manchin in uh, Washington, D.C., switching parties? He's often been talked about as the Democrat from West Virginia, as somebody who might feel more at home in the Republican Party. But he's always resisted because he is a historic Democrat uh, and doesn't feel in his 70s now, although I have to say it looks like he's about 50 and very vigorous. But he never quite wants to do it, Kim. Yeah. By the way, it's interesting you should say that, Paul, because I think what has North Carolina Democrats who concerned is that State House Speaker Tim Moore, uh, a Republican, uh, when he was talking about his discussions with Cotham, just casually threw in there that it was just one of a number of conversations he had said he'd had with Democrats who were increasingly concerned that they were not allowed to talk or vote their conscience, which has some people wondering if you're going to see some more defections in North Carolina. Joe Manchin, I have a certain standing. He's clinging to the old-fashioned idea of the Democratic Party. Big tent, you can represent people from all corners. I think his problem with this is that he is increasingly one man in a big corner, and there's nobody else around him. And we've seen how his party has treated him. They kind of beat him up and cajole him and entreat him to join into the things they want. He agreed to that late last year with the Inflation Reduction Act. In return, they were supposed to give him a big permitting reform and treat fossil fuel energy with a little bit more respect. Instead, they've just been digging on that promise again and again. So he says he's not going to do it, although he's been pretty cranky just recently. So I guess you never know in politics. All right. Fascinating. We shall follow this and other things as we move into the uh, next presidential cycle election cycle. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Kate. Thank you all for listening. We'll be back again tomorrow with another edition of Potomac Watch.